My name is Nat Friedland, and I have written a book called The Occult Explosion. On this record album, you're going to hear the statements, in their own voices, of today's most important leaders in the occult and in ESP research. I think you will find that listening to the ideas of these people is going to change and greatly enrich the way in which you look at your world. At its highest levels, the occult is an adventure in mind expansion. Welcome now to the Voices of the Occult Explosion. Okay, I think a witch has got to be female. I, I don't believe it's possible for a male personality to occupy himself with this type of activity. And um, besides being female, a witch has to be psychic. And I think that um, anyone who says they practice witchcraft and is not highly intuitive and doesn't have extrasensory perception is lying to themselves. Because you have to be able to project your emotions and influence your environment along the same um, bridge that you would ordinarily be receiving impressions from. What does the history of witchcraft, where did it come from? Well, I think witchcraft has existed ever since the beginning of man. Anytime a man, mankind, attempts to alter his destiny in some way with various methods that may have nothing at all to do with anything obvious. Whenever you take an inanimate object and you say, this is going to bring me love, or this is going to bring me courage, or happiness, or wealth, uh, that's witchcraft. And I think uh, man has always needed to do this, and witchcraft has always existed. What about the religious uh, aspects of witchcraft, or organized covens? Well, there are organized covens today that I don't really value too much. I think a lot of them are people looking for some kick, wanting to find another way of existing. They may be sincere, but I, I don't think they have anything to do with religion. Most of them that, have, that I've had contact with are not terribly informed about the uh, religious origin of the witchcraft they say they're practicing. And the Druid religion, you know, has gone out of existence quite some time ago. Where did you get, you know, your knowledge of witchcraft? Well, I come from a group of witches who believe that it's a very personalized action. My grandmother's a witch, and my grandmother's great-grandmother was a witch. I'm six generations of witches. And I learned from my grandmother when I was a very young child how to do all sorts of little things that she thought were very potent and important, how to make packets and amulets and cast spells and you know, perform rituals and use all sorts of methods to read into the future. And she was convinced that the objects were the things that had the magic in them. And I'm convinced that she had the magic in her energy and her emotion and her subconscious. And that's where the thing took place. Give us sort of an example of a ritual or spell that you know, would be used for a specific end and you know, how would this work? Well, there are all sorts of things that you can do. I'm convinced that if you create your own spell, it has a uh, greater effect on your life. But very many people don't have the confidence to do this as beginners. So I think a simple spell is to light the flame of a candle and to sprinkle a circle of salt around the area that holds the candle and you, and then write down on, on a piece of paper what it is you want to accomplish in very simple statement, maybe a sentence or two, and then burn this in the flame of the candle, all the while concentrating very dynamically upon the uh, effect of the flame. And when you have burned this to an ash, then you know that what you want is about to come your way. The main purpose in the practice of witchcraft is to generate within yourself a very high level of energy that will then carry you successfully through all situations. So the main point is to psych yourself up and reach some kind of an emotional, physical, intellectual high. And this is done through a very rigid, disciplined method of performing a ritual. The people who say they are witches, and there are very many thousands of them in the United States, may or may not be witches. That I don't know. I haven't gone through any special sort of a research or survey on this. 
but there are very many thousands more who don't say they're witches, who do practice. There are men who are in very high office who utilize the abilities of witches and uh, who are convinced that these things work. And scattered throughout the world, I, I couldn't say them, probably are millions. Witchcraft only works so long as the witch is capable of sustaining the energy needed. And I think the witch is at times able to uh, falter. So long, you have to be obs obsessed with what you're doing. You have to become completely involved in it and almost psychopathic about getting the thing you want. And, and if you're not able to sustain that high pitch of uh, psychoses and obsession, you don't do it. You, you can't cast the spell. So it works so long as you work at it. And it doesn't work when you become a little bit normal. Well, you know, what do you feel you know, then is the value of witchcraft as opposed to just you know, being a psychic? I think psychics are a very passive <laughs> lot. And a witch utilizes that same ability to sense and know and feel. But she sends out information rather than merely receives it. And she's able to activate uh, conditions and stimulate the environment into certain directions. I am psychic, but I use it in another way. I don't just receive thoughts. It's too passive a role for me. Uh, do you think that most people have the ability to become a witch? Or? No, I don't. I don't think most people can become witches any more than most people can write or dance or sing or paint. I think you're born with the ability you don't have to be born into a family of witches, but you definitely have to be born with the emotional capacity. And in the same way that everyone can't possibly project the emotion of love on a movie screen, everyone can't perform witchcraft either. I'm convinced after 13 years of study and investigation that the Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial vehicles whose origin, in other words, is off the Earth. So-called flying saucers, in other words, are real. Now, the terms flying saucers and UFOs have been used to mean a great many things. What I mean are the reports of things having definite size, shape, and texture, and behavior that's very peculiar, that is unlike things that we know how to make. And reports like this that cannot be identified as known phenomena by competent investigators this is perhaps 10 to 20 percent of the total number of reports that have been examined by investigators. Now, the phenomena is worldwide. It's been going on heavily for 25 years and sort of lightly for 2,500 years as far as we can tell. Every country in the world, all kinds of people. There are many multiple witness cases. There are a number of cases involving separate witnesses, that is, who don't know, people who don't know somebody else is watching the same peculiar thing and who independently report what they observe. There are many cases involving radar, cases involving not only radar on the ground, but radar in the air, and a visual observer on the ground, and a visual observer in the air. There are many cases in which we are dealing with reports of things fewer than 500 feet away from the observer. In some of these cases, the object has been observed on the ground, and observed landing and taking off as well, and in some cases, accompanied by humanoid-looking creatures. That is, people, two arms, two legs, a head, and a body. Maybe people is the wrong word, but creatures nevertheless. Now, the total picture here, in other words, is an impressive amount of data available from the Air Force, from the private organizations, and there are a number of quite respectable ones, from the professionals. There are many scientists who have spent many years of effort digging into UFO sightings and who find that there is an inexplicable residue, 10 to 20 percent, which point very clearly toward intelligently controlled extraterrestrial vehicles. So I'm convinced, in other words, not because I want to believe that we are being visited, not because I wish we were being visited to help us solve our problems, but because the evidence, the data, the reports, the total collection of information that is available to the interested observer is overwhelming. One of the major things that I bring to this subject is a background in advanced technology. So that to me, coming here from another solar system isn't bothersome. 
it's feasible with what we know now from programs that I have worked on directly, fusion propulsion systems, for example. The behavior of UFOs in the sky, the sudden changes in the direction, the ability to hover, to move straight up and down, to move silently without an exhaust, to go forward and then back along the same line, clearly is not behavior that's achievable with present aircraft. That doesn't mean that it violates the laws of physics. It is clear if one studies the data that the government has misled the public, and it is also clear that there have been a number of classified cases. I worked under security for 14 years. Let me assure people that the government can keep secrets if it so chooses. We hear about the ones they can't keep. We don't hear about the ones that they can. So I am absolutely convinced that someplace in the government there's a big collection of UFO data. Whether this means that we've captured one, duplicated it, or whatever, I haven't the faintest idea. I have many reports from people who were in the service of strange events occurring where there was a cordon put up around an area in which something had landed and which the object, whatever it was, was carted away. Now, this would be equally true if this were a Russian spacecraft or a Russian uh, missile warhead or whatever, as if it was a UFO. I've heard many such reports, all kinds of rumors about what we have sitting hither, thither, or yon in the way of creatures, craft, and what have you. I've never been able to establish the validity of these. This doesn't prove that it hasn't happened. It seems clear to me that if the government had captured a UFO, the thing to do would be to cart it off to a secret laboratory and try to figure out how it works. You don't tell the public, and you don't tell the Russians. And so, hopefully, after several years of hard work and billions of dollars, you figure out how it works, then you've got the system. And you still don't tell the other guy because you don't want him to develop a countermeasure. This is standard operating procedure. When the first A-bomb was exploded, in the newspapers the next day, there was an article that an ammunition dump had blown up, and fortunately nobody had been hurt. We didn't say an atom bomb was blown up. One of the many myths about UFOs is that there haven't been any good sightings, that all sightings have been by typically a drunken bum at 3 o'clock in the morning, that sort of thing. One of the cases that has really excited me is a very recent one, one that occurred in Delphos, Kansas, a small town, well, just over 600 people, on November 2nd, 1971, Ronnie Johnson was taking care of the sheep, 7 o'clock at night, cold, wet. I uh, was heading back toward the house to eat dinner when he spotted this glowing object. could feel vibration from it. It was sitting just 7,500 feet away from him, just beyond the corner of one of the sheds on the farm. Suddenly, the glow got much brighter, made a roaring sound. It took off, not straight up because there were trees in the way, but across the shed. He yelled for his parents, who came out and saw this thing leaving in the sky. Didn't believe him that it had been sitting on their soil until they went back to where the object had been. They found several limbs of trees that had been knocked down, and they also found a glowing ring, about eight feet in diameter, about a foot across. Ring of soil glowing and some glowing spots on the trees. Ronnie's mother touched the soil. Her fingers went numb. She rubbed the soil off her fingers onto her leg. It became numb at the spot where she touched it. She couldn't take pulses at the resting home where she worked for two weeks. Uh, the soil remained dry for months, didn't support germination of plants, wouldn't absorb moisture. The rest of the place was a quagmire in the middle of winter, and there was the ring of soil, dry as could be, lighter in color. We're doing tests on that soil to try to establish what happened, why it won't grow, and that sort of thing. This is but one of hundreds of similar kinds of landings that have been observed all over the world. A different kind of case in the sense that, in this case, creatures were involved, is the story of Betty and Barney Hill, a couple up in New England, who were taken on board a saucer, physically examined, put back out, told they wouldn't remember what happened, and didn't remember anything other than what happened before they were taken on board the saucer. It was only after regressive hypnosis, on the part of a very competent psychiatrist, three years later, that they found out what had happened. They each relived the same experience this bizarre experience of being taken on board by these humanoids against their will, examined, put back out. They were treated as specimens. I spent four hours with Betty and Barney, convinced that they were telling the truth. There are cases like this en masse. They have been described in government publications. Most people have never read the publications. It is not true that UFOs are observed mostly over the United States. It's a worldwide phenomena. There have been very busy years, flaps, if you will, in France, in South America, in Australia, in Canada in England, in Africa, in Japan, everywhere. Uh, it's also a, a modern myth that the number of UFO sightings was zero before, say, 1947, and has been a big number ever since.
the modern era began in the middle of the Second World War with sightings in both over Germany and Japan and by American and uh, Axis pilots, each thinking the, it was the other's secret weapon that they were watching. But actually, there are documented sightings that go back thousands of years. They weren't called flying saucers, but they certainly match in the physical descriptions and in the behavior what we today refer to as flying saucers. Another area about UFOs that really intrigues me is the philosophical one. The implications for mankind of finding out that he is neither alone in the universe nor the most advanced civilization. I think man's ego has really stood in the way of mankind moving in the right direction that is a, a peaceful world for all the people on it. And I think that perhaps the most important thing about UFOs is that it will force the younger generation to think of themselves as being earthlings rather than Americans or Russians or Chinese, black, white, male, female. If the people of this planet start thinking of themselves as earthlings simply because they recognize that there's somebody coming from someplace else, and so how can you talk about what country you come from if you're t dealing with creatures from another solar system? I mean, countries are, are trivial compared to planets in that case. And I think that's man's biggest hope for his future. It's not that we'll unite against our invaders, so to speak, but rather that we will grow up. It will start living up to our potential. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a government on this planet that would like its people to think of themselves as earthling first rather than as members of that government first. But the philosophical implications of this are really rather profound. And I think that it's very important for us to recognize something that a great German physicist once said. Max Planck said that new ideas come to be accepted not because their opponents come to believe in them, but because their opponents die and a new generation grows up that's accustomed to them. And so this is why I speak at college campuses. This is why I've given up trying to reach the ancient academics whose minds are made up and they say, don't bother me with the facts, I know they can't be real. And it's because I think that man's biggest hope for the future lies with the youth and with a new look at where man fits in the universe. Astrology is as much of a physical science as astronomy is. The sky is a big circle divided into 12 equal parts. Each part is a sign of the zodiac. And you can tell what part of the sky is what sign by knowing the stars that are contained therein. Where you see the crab in the sky is where cancer is. And we know what sign we are by the fact that the sun is traveling through that part of the sky at your time of birth. There are nine other planets, each of which is in a particular position in the sky. Each planet has mass and weight. Mass and weight gives off energy, whether it be considered radiomagnetic, gravitational, whatever. It does give off energy that travels through the universe and impresses upon us its own particular force. That sets up uh, a pattern from your birth and continues with you through your life by knowing what each of the planets mean and where they are in your particular chart, you know what your basic structure will be. What are some of the proofs of the way this works, you know, in human life? How can you see this demonstrated? You can see the reality of astrology demonstrated by, number one, knowing your own chart and watching your evolution along with it. For example, you know that you are a Cancer and that your basic structure is moody, is uh, fairly psychic, emotional. You see in your progress chart that you have evolved into a Leo, and you will feel a definite personality change, a definite change in the way you relate. You will become a lot more outgoing, flashy, in fact. And if you follow your process and progression through your chart, you just know what's going to happen, and you know where you're going to be going. And if you have your chart as well, you can see what your problems are, your negative points and your positive points, and you can see how to evolve through, with, by, and for them. What do you mean by a progress chart? How can one progress from uh, a cancer to a Leo? Nothing, nothing in the universe stands still. The stars and planets are continuously in motion. And we, from the moment of our birth, don't stand still. We evolve as well. Mathematically, you can see where the planets in your chart are going to be moving. 
You can see from what house they will be going from and to. You can see how they will change. From that, from the mathematical reality, you can translate it into a metaphysical reality and thereby see not only where you are coming from, but where you are going to. Astrology is a, almost a totally mathematical science. It breaks down symbols into language through the process of mathematics and astronomy. Suppose two people were born at exactly the same moment, in exactly the same place. Wouldn't their destinies be identical? Their destinies will be identical depending upon their environment. One of the queens of France back when asked the same question of her astrologer. They found a commoner that had been born the same time and same place and her life followed exactly the same pattern, the only difference being that one was a queen and one was a commoner. They had children born at the same time, they married at the same time, they had illnesses at the same time. What are the most important factors in a person's astrological chart? Everything is important. The sun is your conscious awareness, the moon is your subconscious, Venus is how you relate and feel love, Mars is your physical energy, Mercury is your mind, the way you communicate. Jupiter is your expansiveness and your philosophical spaces. Saturn is your discipline and where the weight comes into your chart, the heaviness. Uranus is your eccentricities, Pluto is your obsessions, and Neptune is your transcendental creative space. Neptune rules music, poetry, motion pictures, and the psychedelic drugs. What's the meaning of the houses in the chart? Houses show how you progress through life. Your first house is your personality. That is the first thing you relate to. Second thing a human being relates to is his money and possessions, an extension of himself. The third is to communicate. The fourth is his home, and also uh, the home of his spirit, the soul. The fifth is pleasures, love affairs, and children. The sixth is service to other people, and if service is not completed, uh, physical illness, Seventh is partnership, not only marriage, but business partnership and relating to the outside world, the public at large. Eighth is death and regeneration. Ninth is travel, long distance travel, higher education and philosophy. Tenth is what the world expects you to be, usually your, your profession. Eleventh is friends, hopes and wishes. And twelfth is the underworld, the nebulous house of karma, as it were. Each house is ruled by a sign from Aries right through Pisces and has the same general characteristics as that sign. What's the connection of astrology to karma? Astrology shows you how you work out your karma this time round. Is the astrology column in the daily newspaper of any use? Is, is that real astrology? The astrology of the daily newspaper is good for amusement value. It takes into consideration your particular sun sign and where the moon is in the sky at the time. It's fragmentary astrology, and as such cannot be given any value. What's the most important thing for a person who wants to start knowing about astrology to find out? Does he just have to know the entire system to, for it to really make sense? The most sense? important thing for a person just getting into astrology is having his own chart done. No one can relate to astrology unless they see how it relates to them as a human being. Until then, it's just a very nebulous, semi-occult, unknown field. Once you have your chart done and see how astrology shows you who, what, why, and when you are, what you are, you can begin to understand it. If you want to get into it further, there are a lot of good books that can teach you the system. And it's not all that hard to learn. The mathematics are no more difficult than third grade mathematics. And it's really good to know it yourself because you can follow your own chart. Your, your natal chart is where you were when you were born. Your progressed chart shows where you are now. And through the same simple mathematics, you can go even further into your future and see where you will be. And you also can relate the transiting chart, where the planets are in the sky at this particular instant in time and space, to you. It becomes a multi-level chess game. You know what each of the pieces means. You know how they work, and interrelating the three shows you exactly where you are. What does the Aquarian age mean in astrology? 
time span is broken up into 12 great ages. Each age is the way that particular generation evolves, the, the light that is given off. Uh, each age is approximately 2100 years. The age we're just coming out of is the Piscean Age. The light of the Piscean Age was Christ, known as the Fisher of Men. Each age starts with the energy being totally pure and used thusly. During its time, it becomes corrupt, reaches a peak, and dies as the new age is born. We are at the point of transition between the two ages. The dregs of the Piscean Age, the Christian culture, are just starting to fade. The Aquarian Age people are just starting the process. The definition of the Aquarian Age would be energy used purely, intellectually, and electrically. How much of what's you know, in a chart is something that you can overcome, or how much of there is that you can't escape? The stars impel, they do not compel. Uh, you can change anything you want to change. It's quite wonderful to get to know these composers as people, and it is, of course, a great privilege. Chopin is not at all like I might have thought he would be. He's not melancholy at all. He's quite light-hearted. His conversation is bantering, and he often teases and makes little jokes. Um, he's a very quick worker. He, he works far more quickly than any of the other composers. And I've also found that he's very considerate. If he's been working with me and we've got, say, two pages of music written out, and then he finds my concentration is waning because I'm getting tired, he winds the piece of music off quickly so it, is, it isn't left incomplete. But then sometime later, this can be weeks or months later, he'll come along and say, well, now I'll give you the rest of such and such a piece of music. And he'll give me quite an, a number of bars, perhaps two or three dozen bars, but instead of this being added to the end of the music, he tells me exactly where it has to be inserted in the music. I've also found that Schubert is a very delightful person, very lovable, very modest still, and quite a gay sort of person. And he communicates very smoothly and quietly. I think Schubert is the only one of the composers who sometimes alters music just after he's given it to me. Um, we'll be working away and suddenly he will say, stop, I, I don't like those last two bars, cross them out and I'll give you something else. Uh, all the other composers seem to have the music prepared before they bring it to me, but it's as if Schubert is still composing the music as he actually gives it to me. Uh, I remember when he dictated Momo Musical, after he completed it, I wondered what other people would think of it. And Liszt stepped forward and he said, that piece of music is both excellent and exquisite. And I found that a number of people agree with Liszt. And I was delighted to find Liszt so generous in his praise of another composer's music, which I understand is typical of this great soul. When Liszt first began to communicate music to me at length, he used to do so by guiding my hands over the pianoforte keyboard, rather in the same manner as automatic writing is performed. But he has changed his method now, and he usually dictates music note by note, in, in the same way as some of the other composers. He usually speaks in excellent English, which I think he's practised a great deal since leaving our world. But when excited, he lapses into German. Sometimes he uses French. I can usually see Liszt quite clearly whilst he's communicating, although there are times when I hear his voice but cannot see him at all. When he offered to transmit Grubilei to me in the presence of three British Broadcasting Corporation officials, I felt his presence in the room at first, then he appeared very clearly before me, looking very calm. He gave this piece of music by the process of dictation, 
and it was some weeks before I could play it passably well after having been given tuition by him. This turned out to be rather complicated for me to follow as the key signature contains six sharps and the time signature is 5-4 in one hand against 3-2 in the other. I was alarmed to find him attempting to communicate a piece of such a tricky nature which appeared on paper to be disjointed. I asked him why he did not choose something more spectacular such as a new Hungarian Rhapsody which I thought would make a greater impression on the BBC officials. But he replied, with a little smile, that he thought the music he was giving to me would be far more impressive to them than a Hungarian Rhapsody. After I had taken down about two dozen bars from him, I wanted to hear what the music sounded like. On paper, it appeared to me rather strange looking with accidentals thrown in apparently indiscriminately, strange looking chords. So I turned to the BBC officials and asked whether they would mind if I tried to play it over. But alas, I found I couldn't play it because I couldn't get the right rhythm. I found it quite impossible to cope with 5 4 against 3 2. One of the BBC officials then offered to play it through. And he sat down at the piano, played what we'd got so far. Then he sat back, gazing at the manuscript in front of him. And there was a hush for a few seconds. And I wondered whether he was going to say, well, I don't think much of that. But he turned round to me very slowly and said, Mrs Brown, I think you've got something here. You can imagine how relieved I was to know that the music Liszt was dictating was actually something considered quite valuable. At first, I didn't care very much for Grubilei, but now it's grown on me, as some pieces of music can, and I think perhaps it's one of the most beautiful pieces that Liszt has ever dictated to me or given to me. Uh, he must by now have communicated some 200 pieces of pianoforte music of various types, Hungarian rhapsodies, very complicated pieces which are difficult to play, and some which are not so difficult but are perhaps quite enchanting to listen to. But I think of all the pieces he's given me, this one is the most precious to me, especially as he so kindly communicated it in front of witnesses.
search for knowledge, I must learn the secret art. Who dares to help me raise the one whose very name seals my heart? Master Art! Discard your clothes and come on foot through streams and fields and moonlit moors. Your body soaked in secret oils. Join me in my search for power Wives and husbands, bring your kin We'll be as one within the hour Let the Sabbath now begin Come, come, come to the Sabbath Come to the Sabbath, Satan's there Come, come, come to the Sabbath Come to the Sabbath, Satan's there Come, come, come to the Sabbath Come to the Sabbath, Satan's there Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Search for power, wives and husbands, bring your kin. We'll be as one within the hour. Let the Sabbath now begin. Come, come, come to the Sabbath. Come to the Sabbath. Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath. Come to the Sabbath. Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath. Come to the Sabbath. Satan's there. Come, come. Come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there. Come, come, come to the Sabbath, come to the Sabbath, Satan's there.
development of such supernormal powers as telepathy, clairvoyance, and control of the autonomic nervous system is most interesting and very probably possible. I call this psychotechnology, but when I think of what human beings are doing with ordinary technology, I wonder what disasters they may bring about by extending their powers of control still further. Several governments are already studying their military applications. I think we should distinguish, like the Buddhists, between the way of powers and the way of wisdom. The way of powers reaches out to an almost godlike control of circumstances. But if its ambitions could ever be attained, if what we call the will or ego could be master of the world, our lives would be as tedious as making love to a plastic woman. Is that what we really want? Think it through. Would you genuinely like to be immortal, omniscient and omnipotent, knowing all and remembering all, without rest or forgetting, forever and ever? The way of wisdom, on the other hand, is concerned not so much with power as with self-discovery. Who am I? And what is really going on? And this way leads to the understanding that my true self is in fact the vast and inconceivable space out of which this universe is produced. My body, your bodies, are points at which it becomes aware of itself like sparks of flame coming and going on the back of the fireplace. And since variety is the spice of life, it takes a different point of view with each one of us and then keeps on letting go of itself in what we call death so that the process is not dulled by monotony and boredom. There is therefore no need for you to rule the world because you're doing it already. But this you is not what you have learned to think of as you, not your ego or personality. 
These are no more than extremely incomplete images of yourself. Because then he knows who he is, the wise one is not ambitious for power. But then, how do we get this knowledge? How can we actually feel ourselves, not as poor little me, but as the background of the universe? Well, of course, you, as you think of yourself, can't do it at all. Because this you is only an image, an idea, with no more reality than Tuesday or an inch. <laughs> if this is understood, the rest is silence. There is nothing left to do but be clearly and vividly aware of what is happening without comment, without putting it into words, without asking questions. This is what we call meditation or contemplation. Simply being aware of truth, reality, or what is in silence without talking to yourself. In this state, it will be seen that, in fact, there is neither past nor future, but just eternal now. Any difference between yourself and what you are experiencing vanishes. There is just this happening. Watch your breathing. Are you doing it? Or does it happen to you? Neither. There is just this going. This attitude may sound passive, but out of the conscious passivity of meditation, as out of the unconscious passivity of sleep, there comes, by reflex, enormous energy, the energy of infinite space. Listen. By just letting my breath fall out, not pushing it out, comes this. Is there, is there really a communication from one mind to another mind? The question has been asked and kicked around for at least a century among scientists. And most, what I'd call hard-nosed scientists, say, of course not. It's obviously absurd. If there were such a thing, we wouldn't uh, be surrounded with such mystery. We would be able to say, I'm thinking of something, what am I thinking of? And be able to reproduce it in a laboratory. I wish it were that simple, it isn't. But with many, many controlled experiments that we've been doing for a good many years, we know that if we want to send a message, whether it's a symbol on a card, or whether it's a very dramatic picture, or whether it is a thought, the message does get through. Sometimes it's very distorted, sometimes it's almost impossible to recognize it, but it comes through, sometimes, rarely. The telepathic message is so clear and so precise that it is absolutely startling. And I'm not talking about here necessarily in the laboratory. I'm talking about people who come in to see me who say to me, I had a vision or I had a dream and I saw my son being killed in Vietnam at 3.40 in the afternoon. Very shaken up, very disturbed because in actual fact, accounting for the difference in time between Vietnam and here, at that very moment that that vision appeared, the son had been killed in the way the vision described. Now, these are spontaneous episodes that occur, and occur so often that Dr. Ryan and his wife in uh, Durham, North Carolina, have about 10,000 such reports on file, and I haven't been working nearly as long as the Ryans have, but I've got a collection of about 1,000 such stories on file. And it's awfully hard to discredit that kind of evidence. It's startling that suddenly, after 80 years of research that was going on in the laboratory, and uh, very dull kinds of research, doing all sorts of trial after trial with card guessing. Suddenly, in the last three or four years, exploration in psychic phenomena has just mushroomed. And I think there are two reasons. 
One is a book that was published not too long ago, 1970, called Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain, which very definitely indicated that a lot of work in the Soviet Union is devoted to research in parapsychology, in the fields of telepathy and psychokinesis, which is moving objects at a distance with one's own mind. Now, that's a very strange thing for the Russians to be working on, particularly since they are devoted to a dialectical materialism. And what they're researching is anything but material. It's ephemeral. It's of the mind. And this book so well documented what was going on in the Soviet Union that I personally, as a parapsychologist, and several other American parapsychologists, traveled to the Soviet Union to find out if that book was an accurate description of what was going on, and we found out that it, that it was. Well, this suddenly started a new era in parapsychological research because the Russians are using very sophisticated electronic equipment and they're doing all sorts of things that we just hadn't thought of before. That put us on our metal and we started to work to see if we could get the results the Russians have gotten and that leads to my own particular interest of the past couple of years which is a special kind of photography. It's a photography that's been around for about 85, 100 years but was relatively ignored until somebody in the Soviet Union named Kirlian developed an apparatus that could take pictures of human parts of the body or metal or leaves and he found out that there was emanating using this electrical radiation field photography emanating from the leaf or the human being what in old parapsychological terms was called an aura, but which the Russians don't like that kind of word. They call it a bioplasma body. I don't know what to call it. I, uh, I think Americans like to refer to it as corona discharge because that has a nice, respectable, electrical feeling to it. But whatever it is, this emanation that becomes visible with radiation photography shows that the human body or any organic material like, for example, the leaves of different kinds of plants or flowers will change its structure and its emanations and its internal characteristics depending on what we do to it. For example, we have taken leaves and we've slashed them and after slashing them, when we take a picture in color, where the slash was is just oozing with red stuff that looks very much like blood. Well, we haven't tried slashing human beings. I, I think that would be a nice thing to do, and if I ever get courage, I'll do it on myself, but I certainly couldn't ask for volunteers. But with human beings, if we give them a drug, for example, their whole emanation changes very dramatically. And we've tried all kinds of drugs. Some certain drugs increase the emanation, other drugs decrease it so that it's almost non-existent. In other words, we think we're looking at some characteristic of the body that the ancients, even in biblical times, or certainly in um, India, the yogis, have frequently described this radiation that is emitted from people, from all living nature, which is part of the body. It penetrates with the physical body and extends a certain degree beyond the body. And in occult literature, they call it, I think, the astral body. Some of the most interesting research that's being done right now is using physiological equipment. Everybody knows that there is such a thing as the electroencephalogram, that we generate brain waves and that they can be recorded. Well, what's being carried on those brain waves? Is it some sort of telepathic message? And there are other things that we can look at, too. For example, uh, there is such a thing as vasodilation, which means that the blood vessels in the fingers and around the periphery of the body, uh, when one is excited, get constricted. And one is when one is relaxed, they become dilated. The blood flows to the surface. Now, that's a very simple physiological phenomenon. We all know about it. But what Douglas Dean, for example, who's an eminent parapsychologist, was able to show was that we can use this vasodilation, this flow of blood in or out of the blood vessels on the periphery of the body to demonstrate telepathic messages. And what he did was a very simple but interesting experiment.
he would have a person lying down with the attachment of, called a plethysmograph on his finger, and he would simply be reading names from a telephone book. But every once in a while, he'd put in a name that was very personal and meaningful to the subject. And for all the names that were read out of the t telephone book, there was just perfectly ordinary vasodilation. But when the name that meant something came along, there would be on the plethysmograph sudden constriction of the blood vessels, which showed that there was a response physiologically in that person. Then Douglas Dean went into another room where the person couldn't hear what was going on and would read these names. And the same thing would occur, as if telepathically they were picking up that name even though they couldn't hear it. Very extraordinary. Uh, that work is preliminary, but it certainly has been uh, replicated several times and is well worth pursuing. In other words, our bodies tell us a lot if we would just pay attention to what they had to say. The history of ESP is, is a rather fascinating one because it was started by the best scientists in the field, uh, their respective fields, physicists, biologists, and so on, in England. And what they were very interested in, oddly enough at that time, were the phenomena that come with hypnosis. For example, Sir William Barrett was a, an eminent physicist who was also a very good hypnotist. What period of time? This was 1885 through 1900, early on. And it's interesting, incidentally, that most of the work with unconscious mind was going on at that time. It was beginning. Freud was doing his preliminary work, exploring the unconscious mind through dreams. Uh, in England, a man, a very eminent scholar by the name of F.W.H. Myers, was exploring what he called the subliminal mind. We've now used that word subliminal for advertising, you know, if we get something below the threshold of what we can see, but nevertheless makes an impression. And he went into the unconscious mind, and with hypnosis, men like Sir William Barrett and uh, other very eminent English scientists were also exploring the unconscious mind. And they found out that in a deep state of hypnosis, the hypnotized subject could tell them what they were thinking about. Now, that's a pretty remarkable finding. And they wanted to know if this could be documented in the laboratory to demonstrate that there was and is such a thing as telepathic communication. Now, the interesting thing about the hypnosis is that the hypnotist can't read the subject's mind. It's the hypnotized subject who can read the hypnotist's mind. And one of the most famous experiments that Sir William Barrett did was to take a rather illiterate Irish girl, young girl, get her hypnotized deeply, and this started as an accident. While she was in the hypnotic state, he suddenly got the desire to have a peppermint, and he popped a mint into his mouth, and the girl spluttered and said, Why, Ford, you put a peppermint in my mouth? Now, it wasn't in her mouth, it was in his mouth, but she tasted it. And he was so startled by this that he went into another room, and then he went into closets, into a, another house, and did this peppermint tasting experiment, and then used other tastes, and she picked it up every time. Well, it's interesting that that research sort of went underground. Nobody pursued it, or if they did, they didn't get any results. But now, in Czechoslovakia, and interestingly enough, it's in the Czechoslovakian army that they're doing these experiments, I saw a film where a Czechoslovakian psychiatrist hypnotized a subject and then went through a very elaborate controlled experiment where there were eight different substances to taste and in a double-blind experiment, one was picked randomly, and he tasted a lemon, and the hypnotized subject reported lemon. And then he tasted another sub substance, pepper, and the hypnotized subject tasted pepper. So that this is still going, a hundred years later, this kind of experimentation is still going on, but we haven't yet made it so commonplace that anybody in their laboratories can reproduce it. And until we can do that, most scientists in the United States simply will not believe us. In all of this psychical research, the process that goes on is still an unknown quantity. And until we know what area of the subconscious or unconscious mind is functioning to give us these results, we're just going to have to say we're getting results, but we don't know why. Yoga is a system of physical, mental, and spiritual development. It's a system or a method of physical, mental, and spiritual development. What can you gain through the system? 
starting from physical, you gain perfect health, you gain the possibility of not getting into disease. It is like, a, you know, one protects oneself by different things, vaccinations or taking something to prevent. When you go on a long journey, they said you should take such pill not to be seasick or something. Yoga helps all this. And then also, mentally, it is that of a sudden you find out, you find out it very soon, it is not after, you know, years and years of practice, you find out that you have a much calmer sleep and that your mind is kind of not becoming that agitated and if something explodes behind you, you will not jump up. And it widens your horizon. In one of the yoga texts, it says that if you do the yoga postures, which is always combined with the deep breathing, these postures have a effect upon your physical body. And correspondingly, in about three to six months, a molecular change takes place also in your mental makeup. And then the horizon widens. And then, then you are not anymore impatient, and then you are not anymore intolerant to others, and you don't think you are the only one who is right, and so on. Everybody is entitled to their opinion and go their way, and so on. So, and yoga does not interfere with anyone's religious beliefs or disbeliefs. Meditation is not prayer. You just choose the object of meditation. And ideally, you become one with it. It takes time. You don't at once sit down, here you got it. There was a story, and I do not know whether it's a story as an illustration or it took place, but it doesn't matter. It's a very good story. Like a, a master in India had his pupils meditating and they came out of these little cubicles and then one, telling, you know, what the result was and one of the pupils wasn't and wasn't coming out. Then finally the master called him out and he said, I cannot come. My horns prevent me to get through the little door because he was meditating on being a deer. And that is just to illustrate that the ideal meditation to become one with the object of your meditation. And that is why you have to be very careful as to what or whom you choose as an object of your meditation. What is your teaching approach? Do you teach meditation? Do you teach the postures, the asanas? Asanas I teach, but I... Uh, well, asanas, they have to, to know the asanas, the deep breathing, the relaxation techniques, but meditation along with it. Just to teach the asanas alone, I'm not interested, because the meditation is something that brings you, you know, further on the path. Yoga asanas, it's alone are not enough. You say it's a combination of the physical positions or exercises mm -hmm. and Mental. proper breathing and meditation mm -hmm. that will you know, achieve yeah. these results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know so many people who kind of don't care about anything else, like say they have heard that, oh, you can lose some weight or you can get rid of your headaches or, you know, things like that, and that's all they're interested. But within a few months, there is such a tremendous change in their, in their makeup that it's not the same person anymore. Tell us something about why the asanas work. Why is this different from, or more effective than ordinary physical exercise? Calisthenics and so on. Because every asana is performed with the deep breathing, and the breathing is a kind of opening from the microcosm into macrocosm. If you do not do any asana, supposing you would be perfect in them, and most people in the Western world, they do the asanas without the deep breathing. It will never have the same effect because it is through breath that you connect yourself, you make this connecting link. Did you get the results then just by proper breathing without the asanas? Uh, yes, not to the same extent, because you see every asana affects one or several of our glands and organs, especially the endocrine glands. If you are just sitting and doing the breathing, for instance, your pituitary gland will not be affected, or your pineal gland will not be affected, or your, your um, thyroid gland will not be affected, or the um, adrenal gland. They will not be affected if you just hear, you assume the position. And this position, you take in the deep breath, and you then 
get into this position. So, physically speaking, an extra supply of blood is rushed to that particular place which the asana is uh, designed for. It is as simple as that. Someone who was interested in starting yoga and hadn't really done it, how would you advise them to go about it? Well, I will tell you, it's always better to have a teacher. But my contention is, it is better to have a good book than a bad teacher. What does it feel like to be a psychic? You know, how does the process work in your mind? I have a good answer on that. I would give everything away if I could have my own life and if I could have, if I could switch it off. My gift it is always there. There is a mind and a subconscious mind. Sometimes many people will say, hey, I was here before. I sure was here before, we have no explanation for it. Or sometimes, even you, that you think, oh, somebody called, oh, that's him. You can call it coincidence. It's not coincidence anymore. If I talk about 15 years ago about ESP, nobody wouldn't believe it. So we didn't discuss the service what we can do with the mind. We only use about one and a half percent with the mind. That's all that we do. There's a mind and a subconscious mind. Well, when you are having a psychic impression, what does it feel like in your mind? What does it feel like to you? Well, let me put it this way. When I work in a murder case, I forget everything. I even don't think about my family or my father or mother. I don't work that way. When I have an object, clothing means nothing to you. But I sit quiet and like a staring field, like a TV screen, and I see the picture. And I take the clothing in my hands and I go to the place. I make a mental picture. Let me put it this way. When I ask you, here is a pencil and a piece of paper, uh, would you draw your home? And you take a, a paper and you're going to draw your home. Living upstairs, you draw your home and your area. What are you doing, sir? You make a mental picture, right? Mm -hmm. So, when I go to a crime, there is always a mental picture. I will prove it to you. When you see an accident on a road, on a crossroad, where five people are killed, a terrible accident, and you leave that place, and you come back two years later, and you stay on that stop sign where you have to stop, and you will say, oh my gosh, yes, I remember the place. And what are you doing? You make a mental picture in your mind. Uh, what about a radar? A radar is down by tubes. And I, but see, 600 miles away. Now, how you explain that? When you take a pigeon, a bird, a pigeon, you bring up his little puppy, and you let him fly, and you take him 300 miles with you, he will find his home back. In other words, we even didn't sketch the service, what we can do with the mind. So it is not an electric impulse at all. It is things that we don't know yet. Everybody has psychic phenomenal. You can take it or leave it, but it's true. Even animals has it. Want more and more people going to believe in psychic phenomenal. It is a shame that the government is not putting up the money and opening a research foundation in psychic phenomenal and test everybody what claim to be psychic. Russia is doing it. Russia is 10 steps farther in psychic phenomenal as we are today. Why is your psychic gift so much more powerful than ordinary people's gifts? I never had a gift before. I was a house painter and uh, I was in China for nine years. I came back in 1939 and then the war broke out in 1940, the 10th of May in Holland. We were fighting the Germans for six days, and then we gave up. We couldn't hold them. So after the occupation, my father did a small painting business. And I was not the man, but sit still. I live on my mother and father's lap. So my father said, well, you can help him with painting. So I was not a house painter. So he put me on the roof on a 46 feet high ladder, and I put to paint windows and a part of the roof. Now, I'm six feet three, and I put the ladder right in the middle, and I paint it on both sides that I don't can move that heavy ladder. And I hang over too much, and I fall down, and I was unconscious for three days, and I was a different man when I came out conscious. If I could switch off my gift, 
and uh, enjoy life. I only sleep four or five hours a day, but I cannot get it out of my mind. I get up with it and sleep with it. That's the story. Craig Carpenter is the most important messenger among traditional American Indian leaders for the past 20 years. He is an Iroquois, and he grew up with his family in Michigan. Craig claims that he is not any more than a messenger, but I have talked to a number of people who have been healed by Craig, and I know that as a prophet, he told Tom Laughlin, the creator and star of Billy Jack, exactly what would happen for the three years of unbelievably hellish problems that Laughlin faced in bringing Billy Jack to the screen. Traditional Indians remember the original instructions left with them, instructions which they promised faithfully to fulfill, instructions regarding four main points, a given land area that was set aside for each original or traditional nation, a language that was entrusted to each original or traditional nation, certain foods, and each traditional nation that I know of has at least one food unique to that nation only. And the fourth thing that was given or entrusted to each traditional nation was a way of life which included the rituals and ceremonies by which they could contact and work consciously with the unseen guardians of this land and life. Okay, what are some of the things I've seen or know of historically? Um, I was present in a Ford Victoria two-door sedan when a Hawaiian miracle worker with his sacred prayer, which is in the form of a chant, made that car go up the hill about 400 yards, and which perhaps saved our lives because we were stuck, we were snowbound on a hill south of Flagstaff trying to get down to Sedona and Oak Creek Canyon. Other cars that tried to make that hill uh, couldn't. They were either slid off in the ditch or were parked in the road itself. A pickup truck coming from the opposite direction, coming downhill with chains on. We didn't have chains and a load of rocks in the back was sliding all over the road. He didn't even have adequate control. We had no way of getting up that hill at all without miracle power. There were no other alternatives. The snow plows weren't coming. We didn't know what was going to happen. During this experience, the Hawaiian chanting and these very powerful spirits coming in, the general sitting behind his steering wheel was almost in convulsions. I uh, began to fear for him. I didn't know what was happening, and especially when the car started to move ahead up the hill because the general had already placed it in park. It had automatic transmission. He had the emergency brake on, and he had the engine running to keep the heater going so we'd keep warm in there. And yet, in spite of all that, the car was sliding uphill, going uphill, and it wasn't until the car started moving at about 12 miles an hour, I should judge, almost as fast as I can run, that the general realized, finally, what was going on. He released the emergency brake and shifted it out of park and started stepping on the accelerator to make the wheels spin. But that didn't make any difference. We just kept going the same speed anyhow. So I saw that, and what does a Ford Victoria two-door sedan weigh? Two, three tons? I don't know. One man chanting. That's one thing I saw this great spirit's life plan basically talks about the life of paradise that we would have here as long as we followed those original instructions. We'd have this paradise condition here, which we did have. All the explorers I've read from Christopher Columbus himself in the American tropics of 1492 up through Willemer Stephenson and the American Arctic of 1914-1918 all point out that the new territories, the virgin territories they discovered were a paradise peopled by saints. Columbus said that the Indians he found were better Christians than the Christians themselves, for instance. This paradise condition did exist. We are convinced this paradise condition will return after this great purification day. We had to go through a period of four days, which turned out to be 400 years, testing and temptation and tribulation to see if we really understood our original instructions and if we could live up to them, no matter what happened. And this, I guess, was our final examination period for this era. Then, of course, Purification Day comes upon us, which up till 20 years ago we thought would happen in one day, I mean one literal sun. Now we see that it's a period of time, and it may take 10 years or 100 years, whatever. The God's uh, sense of time is far different than we mortals. And here is some of Craig's evidence that Purification Day is coming on us now. There's a primitive or original type of spinning wheel, which is simply a shaft with a flywheel on it. And during the wintertime, Hopis and others, too, for that matter, but Hopis in particular, because these are the ones that remembered the teachings in greater detail than anybody else that I know of. The basic instructions were given to all of us, all of the original nations here, some 400 of them in North America alone. But each nation was given certain details or ramifications of it. 
And when we come together in these last days, as the prophecy said that we should and would, then we can fit these various details together and see the complete picture. And we find from this that Hopis had the most complete picture of all. All right. As they would spin in the wintertime, they would tell stories. And among these stories, we find a, a chain of prophecies centered on this spindle. And they said, you know, someday, just before Purification Day, we'll see objects or machines rolling across the ground on round things like this, referring to the little flywheel, the spindle whorl, on round things like this with animals pulling it. And that's the time to get ready for the great testing and trial and tribulation because it'll soon be upon us. Then after a while, you'll see these machines rolling across the ground with nothing pulling them. These self-propelled machines will get to going so fast and become so popular that they will build special trails for them. And these trails will cut the land all up like a cobweb. And when they use the phrase, cut the land up, right away the listener knows that that's bad, evil, from the destroyer, because that's one of the things we promised not to do, was to cut the land up. It's a gross violation of Creator's law and order to cut up the land, especially to buy and sell it. Land is here for the purpose of producing and sustaining life. It's not to be a commodity of, of merchandise or to get rich off of. It would cut the land up like a cobweb, these different trails. And there'd be two main types of trails. One type would be two strips of metal. And if you stand on it and look down it, these parallel strips of metal look like they come together way off there. But they don't really come together. It just looks that way. And over that trail, these machines would be tied one behind the other. And from a distance, it would look like a great caterpillar or snake growing across the land. And in those machines, or in that machine, there would be whole villages of people moving. The other type of trail would be smooth and... Uh, oftentimes black, it would look almost like rivers going out there. In fact, if you stand on this type of trail and look down it, oftentimes it'll look like water out there ahead of you. It won't really be water, it'll just look that way. All right, these trails would get so numerous, they'd cut the land all up like a cobweb. Then somebody would invent a roadway in the sky, and you begin to see these machines floating overhead. And eventually, those floating machines would become so perfected that you would see whole villages of people floating overhead. Now, how that great spirit knew in that early day that someday there'd be a main transcontinental air route between Los Angeles and Chicago that would go directly over the Hopi villages, I don't know. But I do know that if he planted those villages 10 miles farther to the south or perhaps 10 miles farther to the north, they wouldn't have seen these villages of people floating overhead. And uh, I can see now how that prophecy has been fulfilled. Now, at that time then, somebody would invent a gourd full of ashes. And here they held their hands to show about how big that gourd full of ashes would be. Later on, I found out that the, the, the interior of an atomic bomb, the actual working parts, take away the shielding, it's just about that size. A gourd full of ashes, which if it was ever dropped from this roadway in the sky and it hit the earth, it would boil the water and burn the land and leave ashes over a wide area where nothing would grow for many years. And if that ever happened, that was to be the signal for certain Hopi leaders to stand up and begin declaring their message to the world. The message up to that time consisted partly of these original teachings which were to be kept secret with the different clans and secret societies, each clan or secret society fulfilling its mission, and if it was fulfilled properly, the results would prove of benefit to all the other clans and secret societies in the nation, among other nations of this great land, and its influences would reach from coast to coast. Satan is to us a symbol rather than an anthropomorphic being, although many members of the Church of Satan who are mystically inclined would prefer to think of Satan in a very real anthropomorphic way. Of course, we do not discourage this because we realize that to many individuals a picture, a well-wrought picture of uh, their their mentor or their tutelary divinity is very important for them to conceptualize ritualistically. However, Satan symbolically is the teacher, the uh, informer of the whys and the wherefores of the world. And in answer to those who would label us devil worshippers or be very quick to assume us to be Satan worshippers. I must say that 
Satan demands study, not worship, in its truest symbology. Uh, we do not grovel, we do not get down on our knees, genuflect, and worship Satan. We do not plead, we do not implore that Satan give us what we wish. We feel that anyone who is going to be blessed by any god of his choice is going to have to show that god that he is capable of taking care of the blessings that are received. The Church of Satan is an organization which is comprised of Satanists who because of their abilities and lifestyles and I must stress this, lifestyles reflect a higher than average human potential. Through this avenue, the Church of Satan, the Satanist will become the prototype for a more rational, certainly more finely tuned society. The stress has been on nude altars. The nude altar is an integral part of the Satanic service, and with good reason. The nude altar represents man's fleshly heritage, the very earth, the mother, the, the womb from whence he came. And we feel that there's nothing bawdy, there's nothing licentious, nothing lewd about the nude who is employed for an altar, the nude woman. We also feel that there's nothing wrong with bawdiness, with licentiousness, or with any type of sexual activity, but we feel as though the ritual chamber is no place for it either overtly or covertly. And uh, there's no need to be surreptitious in our ritual, uh, insofar as sexual predilections are concerned. Now, for centuries, both churchmen and laymen have been defining the devil according to their needs, all the while playing the game of muzzling the enemy. They've been inventing the rules of how devils should behave, how Satanists should behave, how devil worshippers should act. And they have been in an authoritative position to do this because, naturally, they are the men of God, they are the men of the church. Supposedly, they are the men who have been doing battle with this devil and been absolving their parishioners of these devil's promptings. In this manner, have they maintained a convenient means by which to escape the blame for their inadequacies or indiscretions? The devil made me do it has long been a stock alibi. Once it held, it held very firm. Now, fortunately, fortunately for us, it has become ludicrous to say the devil made me do it. Yet many, while laughing, still play the old game of self-deceit and blame the devil in one way or another. So the old game is still going on. This is made amply clear in, of all places, the very world of the occult. Witches, who held the devil's name for centuries, now refute Satanism with a passion, employing it as the other side of the fence, which they are most certainly not. All manner of occultists, from ESP researchers to faith healers, denounce Satanists as worthless, meaningless, dangerous, ad nauseum, but never is there to be found a positive adjective about Satanists. We Satanists only smile at such transparencies because they are transparent opinions. Their motivations are most clear. It shows that even those who now claim emancipation from inquisitors need devils themselves in order to make their art more palatable to others. Ironically, the masters of the world have always been Satanists. The masters of magic have always practiced Satanic magic. That is to say, magic without the trappings of self-deceit, because self-deceit is always an inhibiting factor in the ultimate success of a magical rite. The great devil's advocates of the past, Friedrich Nietzsche, Mark Twain, Herbert Spencer, H.G. Wells, Shaw, Bierce, all of them. They were able to hold a looking glass up to man, but man momentarily viewing his self-deceit upon reading the works of these people, could quickly avert his gaze and find solace in his spurious rule books. 
The time for an organization of devils was not yet ready when these devil's advocates existed. For only a strong organized movement could force the mirror of self-revealing before the world's eyes and hold it there. And this is what we wish to do. Hold that mirror up. It has been said that the most powerful thing in the world is an idea whose time has come round. The idea that the enemy might conceivably have something worthwhile to say is now with us. In fact, is that demon within each of us really an enemy, as we have so long been taught? Or will it be recognized as the guiding spirit of enlightenment that it really is? We must remember the word demon does not imply evil, but simply a guiding spirit, a motivating spirit. Man must quit kidding himself. Only when he emancipates himself from dubious interpretations of good and evil, when he truly can rise above good and evil, beyond good and evil, realizing that these terms are probably the most relative terms in man's existence, when he can accept the long obscene name of Satan, because that is a dirty word, Satan, the occult world seems to find it even more so. When he can accept this word, this name, into his vocabulary as a sound to be honored, then he will be free. Until then, he will walk in fear of the very scapegoat he has created, and his potential guide will remain his nemesis. And how would Satanism help you to rise to a higher mental level? Satanism allows us to recognize and to realize our own potential. This is what I would call the balance factor. To realize that man is not created equal, but each according to his own opportunity, natural ability, must make the most of what he has, but he must also realize that he can't force cards into his computer that will not be programmed, that will be rejected. And he must, uh, as a Satanist, knowing this, realizing what his human potential is, eventually, and here is one of the essential points of Satanism, attain his own Godhead in accordance with his own potential. Therefore, each man, each woman, is a god or goddess in Satanism, but must never make the mistake of assuming that there may not be another god or another goddess next door that may be a little stronger than he or she. We feel that Satanism is a religion of life rather than death. I can't understand why some of our detractors seem so impelled or compelled to establish Satanism as a religion of death because nothing could be further from the truth. Satanism believes that we should live this life to the fullest, get every drop of enjoyment from this life. We believe this is the best of all known possible worlds and if there is a better one then it will be Satanists or satanically inspired scientists who find it. And uh, we feel that life is the great indulgence and death is the great abstinence. I've made this very clear in the Satanic Bible, and yet there are still many who will say Satanism is death worship. So you might say this is a gateway to new and more vigorous life for the individual who might be struggling under the burden of depression. The greatest misconception about Satanists is the human sacrifice thing. They seem to overlook the fact that a curse can be thrown without any blood being shed on the part of the magician and uh, or a victim that the magician would choose. The Satanist accepts human life as a very precious thing, albeit wasted on some individuals. And we feel that there is nothing inherently wrong with anyone who just lives and allows others to live according to their own dictates. But nevertheless, curses have to be thrown. 
curse is a symbolic act. This means that it gives vent to one's anger, one's emotions. And if it is directed properly towards the victim, the victim then suffers accordingly. This is the power of ceremonial magic.